great new interview with Michael Rubin and Colin Cowherd. And we've got the national locations are set. The national car show locations are set for the next three years. Stick around. Let's talk about it. To all my sports card collectors, investors, all of my collectibles friends, we are back again. It is another day. It is another card video. How the heck are you doing, guys? Coming up to the holiday week here in the U.S., I'm excited. Kind of that long weekend, really the last good pool weekend before the weather starts to turn, before we get into the fall and we get some football starting. If you're new here and you're looking for daily sports card collectibles content, you have come to the right place, my friends. Please hit that big red button down below below the subscribe button, the like button. If you like what you hear, it helps us kind of get these videos out. We got to get them out. Also, big thanks to channel partner ComC.com, your home for buying, selling, and flipping all the hottest trading cards. 29 million cards across all sports, genres, and eras. With a ComC.com account, you can purchase cards from different sellers over time and ship them home together later or immediately reprice them and sell them right there in the ComC marketplace. I like to call them the OG vault. Before vaults were cool, it was ComC. Check out ComC.com. All right, on YouTube, this one just popped up for me yesterday, kind of randomly. I think it's through Vault, uh, but I'll put a link in the video description if you want to check it out yourself. It's only about a 30, 35-minute interview, and it's with Michael Rubin and Colin Cowherd, which, and Colin Cowherd, I'm kind of like, meh. I mean, he does like top 10 lists that are crazy. I feel like he's good at getting attention. He's good on that marketing side, um, and he's a good speaker. He's a good talker, but as far as a lot of his takes, uh, just don't, I'm not really on board with a lot of what Colin's got, but that's okay. This was actually a very good interview. Colin did a good job here with this interview with Michael because it does give you some insights into um, just kind of where things got started with Fanatics, where they're heading, and kind of what got them there. It's good. It's very well done. They talked about the 76ers ownership. They talked about a variety of different things, leadership, etc. But I'm going to stick with just the collectible side of it, just kind of the, the stuff that we're, that affects us, so to speak, the sports card stuff. There's one thing, of course, that was reiterated in this interview, um, but one thing that he said, and he repeated it a few times that I thought it was interesting, and more or less wanting to be, Fanatics wanting to be a one-stop shop for the digital sports fan. And I thought it was interesting that he said digital sports fan, not just not just the sports fan, but the digital sports fan. I think that they're, they are a technology company. Obviously, they are a merchandise company, apparel company, but also really working to build out the technology side. And obviously, just one, you could just tell. They want everything done on your phone. They did talk about the sports gambling side of things, the sports gaming side. And it was kind of funny because we talk about in the hobby, like, are we in the first inning, second inning of, of, you know, the sports card hobby? Well, they were having the same sort of conversation in this interview. Are we you know, early in this or what? And one thing that Michael Rubin did say is on the sports gambling side, he feels like it's first quarter. Like, it's very, very early on that side. So it does look to be that Fanatics is going to get in the ring and compete with the kind of these DraftKings style companies. That is something that is a priority for them. He did sell off his share of the 76ers to be able to do this. So we already did kind of know that piece. Um, he did re reiterate again when he was talking about collectibles and kind of a shot across the bow at existing companies um, or just companies that have operated in the past, really just kind of like, hey, look, the fact that this business was growing and he said with no money put into marketing, that's how he thought that there was really kind of a big opportunity here. And he said he wants to market the category for the first time. That's what he said said market the category for the first time. So excited to see that. And then also innovate products, which I thought that was really kind of interesting. It's a big focus for him to innovate the products. And again, look, you're talking about a company that really has access to all the cool game used stuff, you know, as it comes out. So my expectation is, is their kind of high end products are going to be awesome. That would be my expectation. I think that they're going to really kind of grow out that part. And then he also 
reiterated a better experience for the collector. And he mentioned redemption cards, which I think was kind of interesting because that's kind of that's one piece of the hobby that is kind of a, a stain, so to speak. I shouldn't say a stain. It's kind of a thing that's just people have gotten used to, but you see a lot of complaints about it, just not going right with redemptions. Panini recently is kind of, you know, they're just trying to shed all their redemptions. Um, you know, and so I think that, and that was something he was like, hey, collectors hate redemptions. That's something that we have to do better. So I guess my expectation is for the future as we move into the Fanatics world is I don't expect to see redemptions or if we do, that very few and far between or the redemption ends up being something way cooler than what you would have gotten with that particular card. It'll just be interesting because he he specifically called out redemptions as a problem. Another thing that Colin Cowherd said, he was complimenting Michael Rubin and saying like, hey, obviously you saw something in Fanatics that others did not see. You saw this and you jumped in thinking like, hey, this is a business that's undervalued and we can do so much with it. And, you know, Michael Rubin actually shot back and was like, you know what? Actually, it was the opposite. In 2011, when we took over Fanatics, I was really concerned about Amazon and Alibaba, which Alibaba is a Chinese company that really is, a, it's similar to eBay, uh, sells just a ton of products, massive, massive company. And what he was saying is, is basically these companies have decimated retail. And so him coming in at, you know, an apparel company, he felt a ton of pressure to make something happen because he, the fear was is that, look, this gets swallowed up by Amazon, which I can understand that you're coming off of kind of that uh, the 2009, 2008, 2009 financial crisis that we had. We kind of came through a recession there. So 2011 was kind of a, it was an iffy time. You know, that wasn't a time when Fanatics was really worth a lot of money. And he has really kind of built that out. He said, I am a builder. It was just kind of, it was interesting to really kind of hear his thoughts and you get a little bit more of a scope into his personality and so forth. So it's obvious that he wants speed and delivery being high priority. And I think, again, when, when he's talking about just kind of that fear of Amazon, I mean, that's really what Amazon does best. They now have it to where shipping is like overnight. You order something, it's it's at your mailbox in a few hours. They've talked about having drones in the sky delivering. You know, so Amazon has put a huge, huge priority on the customers just far as like you order something, you get it fast. And so so that's something that it's obvious that Michael Rubin also feels that way. It's just going to be so interesting because if you look at the companies that have been operating in the space, not to say that all that stuff has been terrible, but you know, this is someone that is that is very, very eager to make this better for the end consumer slash collector. I don't know if we've seen that same sort of sense of urgency from other companies previously, not at this level anyway. So that part is going to be really interesting to watch. So again, check out that interview. I'll put the link in the video description. It's a good watch. Also, we have confirmation that the national locations have been set. This was something where at the end of this past natural, natural, at the end of the past national here a month or so ago, they were saying like, hey, we've got uh, Chicago's going to be next year. It was a little bit up in the air as to where that second location was going to be in between 2024, and then back in Chicago 2025. They've settled on Cleveland in 2024 which I'm excited about because I have not been to that one. I've been to Chicago and then Atlantic City. It'll go back to Chicago, but I've only really heard good things about the Cleveland location as far as you know getting there and the, the actual facility itself. So I'm looking forward to that one. I've also got family in Ohio and Dayton, Ohio. So pretty cool. I'm going to see if maybe I can corral some of my family for that one in a couple of years. That's going to be cool. So they have nailed that down. We can start planning. So the next three nationals are going to be in really solid solid locations it looks to be. So guys, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I hope that you have an amazing day ahead. Per usual, stay healthy, stay awesome, and I will talk to you again later.